Father, we thank you tonight for endless days we will sing your praise. There is no God like you, ever faithful, ever true. We worship you, we adore you, we exalt your holy name. We thank you, Father, for the privilege to gather to worship you tonight. Please speak to us, teach us, train us, transform us, build us up, open our eyes to behold wonderful things in your law. Thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Please be seated. Thank you for joining us tonight as we continue to look at building a fulfilling marital relationship. Thank you. Um, we started off by saying that the family is the bedrock of society and family is God's idea and God himself operates out of a family. Uh, Genesis 1 from verse 1, we saw God the Father, the source, the creator. We saw God the Holy Spirit brooding over. And then we saw God the Son, when in verse 3, when he says, And God said, Let there be. And there was. And nothing was created without the word of God. Children are a heritage from God. Nothing enduring, nothing lasting, nothing gets translated from one generation to another unless those who are parents in this generation pass it on to the next generation. Society is molded by the adults who nurture children. What our children are is a product of what we taught them. When God wanted to create heaven and earth, he sent his word. I hope you are getting that. Jesus Christ is the word of God. When God the Father and God the Holy Spirit wanted to create on earth, I think in Hebrews it says, in him all things hold together. Without him was nothing made that was made. All things were made through Christ. They were made by him, for him, and through him. So if we want our society to be better, we must invest in our children so that our children change society. And tonight God is asking us again to watch how we invest in our children and watch how we invest in marriage. Um, I think we should be, those of you at home, um, the outline, chapter one, is on the kingswayharich.org website. We looked at section one on page 20, 19, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we should be on page 20, number two. Yes? Marriage is a permanent and intimate bond between a man and his wife. And we said that marriage is a picture, is a type of God, Jesus Christ, and the church. The church is the bride of Christ. 
Um, and it's never too early to start to prepare for marriage. All of us are preparing for the marriage supper of the Lamb, yes? The church, the bride of Christ is preparing. But those of us who are not married and God calls us to marry, we, we can start to prepare. No one is too young, I would say. Because as long as the, the children are in the family, they, they, are, they are being taught how to raise their own families. As a child, I, I began to define what my home would be like while I was still in my parents' home. I said, I wouldn't like this, I wouldn't like that, I, I would like this, I would like that. So before I was 15, I had, by God's grace, a clear picture of the kind of home and marriage and family I would like. I even wrote down all the, the kind of wife I would like to marry and all her qualifications. She must be God-fearing, she must be, you know. God first, God first. You know. So it's never too, too early um, to start to determine how uh, marriage should be. But we must establish that marriage is God's idea. And we, we go back to that. We said that in, in number one. Marriage is God's idea. Tonight we want to pick up from number two. Marriage is a permanent and intimate bond between a man and his wife, as long as they are both alive. Uh, we'll take the scriptures, Genesis 2, Matthew 19, and Romans 7, please. Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Amen. Verse 23. What do we learn from that verse? We're talking about marriage is a permanent and intimate bond between a man and his wife. As long as they are both alive. Any thoughts? Give you a clue. Sorry? It's an example of God's wisdom. Yes. Yep. It's on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just checking. It's working. Okay. I'm, I'm guessing it means that you become like one person. So you're working as um, an entity, if you like. Yes. What's the difference between bone and flesh? Have you ever seen your bone? One is hard and the other one's soft. Ah, one is hard, one is soft. Contrast, good. When you start to separate bone from flesh, what happens? They don't exist. They don't exist. It's a permanent bond. When you start to tease them apart, there is always pain. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The bone and the flesh. The man is like the skeleton, the woman is like the flesh wrapped around it. The man gives structure, the woman gives function. There's a permanence in God's intention. And when you go into marriage, you go into it with the same understanding that it's for keeps. When we took our marriage vows, they said, for better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Till what? 
till death do us part. God's intention wasn't that we switch it. And there will be times when you will be challenged. And sometimes you will say, wouldn't it be better if I just threw in the towel? Don't give up. No matter how difficult or challenging it may be, the grace of God is sufficient. If God says, hold on, hold on to him and he will send help. But do not go into it as if you are changing a garment that you, you can just go in when I don't feel like it anymore. Love is not a feeling. Yes? Love is a verb. Love is in action. Don't say, oh, I, I don't feel like loving them anymore. I don't feel like it. For God so loved the world, he gave. He, he did something. Love ensues in action. The more you do for the other person, the more you love them. You don't wait for the feeling before you love. You act and the feeling follows. Am I speaking to someone tonight? You, you, you do not stay married based on feelings. You, you stay married based on commitment, based on your fear of God and your word. You gave your word. You gave your word. So will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Uh, how do they say, forsaking all others and choosing to cling to this one. For as long as you both shall live. And what did you say? Yes. I do, yeah. Some people didn't answer. There's some people, the <laughs> some people well, well, if I was the, the officiating minister, and we, we gave them microphones to make sure that it came out of their mouths. It's a commitment. It's not out of convenience. And these days I hear some people take their wedding vows and they say, for richer, for richer. For health and more health. They say they don't want to confess negatively. Faith does not ignore the fact. It holds on to the truth. There will be times when you will not feel like, there will be times when you may be ill. One of you may be ill. You don't say because the person is ill, you walk away and you abandon them. That's not commitment. That's not love. It's a permanent and intimate bond. Um, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of me. What was taken out of me is me. Do not see your spouse as different from you. She's me. And if you hold on to that principle, then you ask yourself, is there anything I will not share with myself? I will take care of her the way I will take care of me. Because she's part of me. She's not a stranger to me. He's not a stranger to me. She's me. She's part of me. All I am, all I have belongs to her. I, should be, I don't hide anything from myself, so I shouldn't hide anything from her. And this is foundational. And I'm, and I'm saying that to us, and particularly for young people as well, um, is a permanent bond. You may have disagreements but you stick together. There are times when your tongue and your teeth have disagreements. Have you noticed? In your mouth, your tongue and your teeth sometimes have disagreements. And I wonder why. And it's usually when you're having something very spicy. And they have this disagreement and then the, the sting of the just goes in there. 
but they live together. One is hard and the other is soft. But they live together in the same mouth. You may bite your tongue sometimes or bite your lip, but you live together, you stay together. No reason is reasonable to pull apart. Except if it is life-threatening. If it is life-threatening, you ask God for grace to address the situation. I'm not saying you stay there for someone to harm you. You, you take precautions, yes. But you don't pull apart. And that also means you don't willfully and deliberately do things to, to extricate yourself from the other. You don't do things to provoke the other person to leave. Some people say, well, they will make him so annoyed that he'll walk away, and after all, he's walked away, then the house will be mine. Really? And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Any thoughts or comments, please? Answers in the most favorable way, and the uh, wonderful blessing comes our way. When we seek to do things God's way and we ask for His blessing, He brings blessings on other things to do with our lives as well. When you honor God in your marriage, He honors you in many ways. Okay, let's look at Matthew 19 5 to 6. I know I've said some very heavy things, but um, God will grant us grace. I, I always go back to the word, the scriptures, and the foundations. Um, don't build your home in anticipation that it will be destroyed. Build your home with the intention that it will last forever. Does that make sense? Don't go in to come out. Go in to stay there. <laughs> when um, where I come from when the woman is getting married they bless her and say to her you are going to your husband's house and you will stay there your room is taken there's no space for you to come back here <laughs> that's all they are saying your room has been reassigned to somebody else. So go there and succeed in your home. It's actually a blessing, not a threat. We love you so much that we wish that you will prosper where you go. And that goes back to, you remember the story of um, Rebecca in Genesis, I think 20, find it for me, please where her, her family was blessing her. Say, my, my, my our sister, may you be the mother of nations. May you be blessed. May your children inherit the, the gates of the enemies. And may you flourish there. They never intended that she would come back or that she would be great where she was. And that's the way we, we should nurture our children and prepare them to be great when they go. They will not fail. They will succeed. They will excel. They will flourish in the name of Jesus. Of course, they can come to visit, but their homes will blossom and flourish, and they will stand independently by the grace of God. Um, so marriage in God's plan is a permanent and intimate bond between a man and his wife. Thank you. If you carry on Genesis 24 to where after they asked her, will you go with her? And then they blessed her. Genesis 24. Keep going. 60.
And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Amen. They sent her off. That you will have many descendants, you become nations, you possess nations. <laughs> but don't come back here. <laughs> and I pray that there will be no need for them to return. Amen. They keep going forward. They keep the next generation should be greater than us. Can you imagine, Elder Morris, if if we went back to horse-driven carts? Yeah? A horse riding on a um, ca horse-drawn carriage. The way you used to ride on a horse-drawn carriage from a Great Oakley to Harwich. If today we now said everybody in Harwich, we don't need cars anymore, we all go on horse, horseback, would that be a good thing to do? Why not? They wouldn't consider it as progress. It would not be considered progress. Our children should be greater than us. And that's, that should be our intention, our desire, our plan. We invest in them. They must be greater than us. It will, it will, it will not be scriptural for our children to be less than us. If they, if they, they rode horsebacks a hundred years ago, now we are riding cars. What will they do in a hundred years' time? Fly. They, they could possibly fly. <laughs> Be flying from here. To, so you could get from here to Dovercourt or to uh, Colchester in 10 minutes. I think some people do that. I don't know how they <laughs> some people do here to Colchester in 10 minutes. But they could have faster ways of doing things. It should be better than us by the grace of God. Matthew 19, 5 to 6, please. And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let, let not man separate. Who said this? You don't know who said this. You started at and. <laughs> to understand the context of a scripture, you read five verses before and five verses after. Okay, so if you track back from verse five, if you go to verse one, Matthew 19 from verse one, please. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Carry on to ten. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If such is the case with the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Amen. Do you want to hear what Jesus, how Jesus responded to that? <laughs> Verse 11, okay, carry on. But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, 
and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. This is what Jesus said. And we live by the principles of Jesus, not by man's opinion or by God's principles. And I would say to us, set your sights on the will of God. Aim for the best. Don't say, well, everybody around me is doing it. Everyone, people are getting divorced. You can do what you like. Of course you can do what you like. But I do not want my home to be like every other person's home. I want my home to be built on the standards of God's word. I want it to be as God intended from the beginning. So I say, Lord, help me to be married and to stay married and to enjoy marriage according to your word. It's not cultural because in some cultures, a man is allowed to marry many wives. Where I come from, a man could marry as many wives as he likes. But as a child, I said to myself, I said, God help me to be married to one woman. There were some decisions I made as a child growing up. I said, Lord, society, the society we lived in allowed, allowed it. But I said, no, I will follow what the scripture says. And God will help us if we are willing to follow Follow. It says, he who is able to accept it, let him accept it. And God will help us keep to his principles in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 7 verse 2, please. You could read 1 and 2, just to give you context. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. Amen. So someone was asking the question last week. Death is the only authorized instrument of divorce. (laughs) Death is the only authorized instrument of separation. Death is the only thing that will put them apart. Um... As, as God originally intended. Can you imagine what it would be like if you became a Christian and you were not sure if Jesus would accept you? Remember the church is the bride of Christ. And when you become a Christian, you connect to him forever. Imagine if Jesus would... Imagine thinking that one day Jesus would wake up and say... I divorce you. It's the same principle. So, um, is there a principle? Is there a, um... So, when um, Jesus is talking, should I take it that he is talking to his children? What about those people that are not his children? Does the same rule apply? Because the the person that the, that the persons that are not his children, they are governed by a different law. So when they come in to when they come to Christ, it means that does it mean that whatever they did before does not count when they come to Christ? So let us say somebody was married before they became a Christian, divorced, and now become a Christian, and is now in the church. How would you advise that person if that person say to you, I would like to get married? Genesis chapter 1. I always go back to the book of the beginnings. Therefore shall an Englishman, is that what it says? Or Genesis chapter 2, what did we read? 2.23, therefore shall a 
a Nigerian man. Therefore shall a Christian man, therefore shall a man. God's principles apply to all humans. The fact that we did not know about gravity doesn't mean that gravity doesn't apply. The same laws that God will apply. Some people ask, so what happens to people who did not know Jesus Christ? What happened to all the thousands or millions of people before Christ? God knows how to address them. So I would say to each one, come to Christ as you are. And allow him guide you. In the final analysis, it is before him that we will stand. God is merciful. You come just as you are. The, the John chapter 8, it says they caught a woman in adultery. And they brought her to Jesus and said, Teacher, John 8, we caught this woman in the very act. What do you say? My first question was, if you caught this woman in the very act of adultery, where is the man? <laughs> well, because they were all men, they had their ways of uh, covering up for one another. Jesus said, what does the law say? Now, it would have been the law of Moses, but notice it was the law of Moses under which they were allowing divorce. Moses allowed them. But God, Jesus said in Matthew 19, we read, from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, so what I will say to that person is, what does Jesus say to you? He says, and I say to you, doesn't matter what the law of your, your society says. It doesn't matter what they could, you could go and get a, um, what they call it now, an annulment or whatever. You could, you could, the law of your land may allow you to do all that. That's okay. That's the law of the land. The law of Moses allowed people to do that. Jesus said, what does your law say? He said, you can't divorce. Okay. That we should stone her. He said, let him who has no sin cast the first stone. And he stooped down to write. He was just doodling on the floor. And then gradually, from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stones and walked away. And then Jesus stood and said to the woman, where are those who accused you? He said, they're gone. He says, has no one condemned you? He says, neither do I condemn you. But go. And sin no more. That was John 8. There was another woman who he met in John 4. The Samaritan woman. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Samaritan. So God's law cuts across cultures. Whether you are Jewish or non-Jewish. Christian, non-Christian. She came to him and... and he said, give me a drink. And she began to quote scripture. You Jews, but we Samaritans, so a cultural divide. Jesus said, I will give you living water. Go and call your husband. Do you must say, I have no husband. I have no husband. He said, well, you have, you have said the correct thing. Because actually you've had five. <laughs> Do you know what? God keeps count. And he didn't say five former husbands. Say you've had five. And the one you are with now is not. <laughs> well, he spoke to her and this woman became an evangelist. She was the first recorded female evangelist in the New Testament. She went and brought a whole village and Jesus stayed with her. 
Don't be quick to condemn anybody. I don't. There but for the grace of God go I. You do not know people's stories. You don't know where they're coming from or what they've been through. But we bring it to God. And say, Lord, here I am. Come to the Lord as you are. And let him make of your life what he wills. That would be my advice. Go to God. See what he says. But these are the principles that we, we stand on. The scriptures are quite clear and they are for all humanity, not just those who believe in Christ um, at this time, because there may be some who do not yet believe in Christ. Could you read the summary for us, please? As soon as a man and a woman get married. Is that your turn now? As soon as a man and a woman get married, God warns that no man should put them asunder. It is a permanent relationship. Are you married? Your partner is the bone of your bones and the flesh of your flesh. God deliberately made you incomplete so that when your partner fits into that loophole in your life, she makes you whole and wholesome in order for the purpose of God to be achieved in your life. Marriage is a permanent relationship as long as both of you are alive. No matter the misunderstanding that seems to be separating you, you need to understand this and pray for God's intervention. My counsel is that you settle down with this bone of your bones. Ask the maker to make him or her and to help you to develop an intimacy with each other so that God's purpose may be achieved and God will answer your prayers. I've had some people say, oh, um, I got married to this woman when I wasn't a Christian. Now that I'm a Christian, can I put her on that and then go and marry a new one? I said, I said <laughs> Jesus is counting for you. <laughs> Say no. <laughs> Stay with this one. So, but she is very, um, she's very cantankerous and very, very difficult. Okay, take it to God in prayer. <laughs> he gives grace. He gives grace for each situation. Number three, marriage is figurative of Christ's union with the church. Christ, marriage is a figure of Christ's union with the church. Let's read Ephesians 5, 23 to 25. Ephesians 5, 23 to 25. For the head, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Verse 24. <laughs> Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in every thing. 25, your turn. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Amen. So the marriage is a picture of the relationship between, the Christ, and, between Christ and the church. The Christ never separates himself from the church. And that gives us security. And you will find that when women are not secure in, the, in, their, in their marriage or when people are not secure in their marriage relationship, they do not give their best. There's a feeling of fear and foreboding and there's insecurity. Christ gives us the assurance of salvation. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So you can boast that God will be with me wherever I go. He called his name Emmanuel, God with us forever. He never divorces us. There are sometimes you don't feel like being a Christian. Does it happen to anybody? Sometimes you feel 
if I wasn't a Christian, I would have shown them. <laughs> Maybe I would have thrown a punch or something. <laughs> no. There are times when you sinned against God. Jesus did not divorce you. He did not deny you. He didn't say, because you sinned against me, I will not give you air for the next two days. <laughs> so if that's the way Jesus treats us, then why do we say, because my husband was annoyed or, or treated me badly, I won't give him food or whatever else? It's a relationship between Christ and... So when you, when you think of your marriage... And you think of, oh, the, my wife annoyed me. Then you now realize, okay, I must be like Christ is to the church. I must treat her the way Christ treated me when I annoyed him. If he forgave me and bore with all my shortcomings, then I should forgive my wife and bear with her shortcomings as well. It's a picture of Christ and the church. So when you, if you are a wife, see your husband as Christ. I thought the men would say amen. <laughs> as wives, I should repeat it. Yes, thank you, sir. You are in the spirit. As, as wives, see your husbands as Christ. Yes? So the same devotion you have to Christ, you should have to your husband. And men, see yourselves as Christ. The same way Jesus so loved the church that he sacrificed his life for her. You to be willing to sacrifice your comforts and all you are for the comfort of your wife. Amen. <laughs> That's what makes it work. Man, see yourself as Christ. Woman, see yourself as the church of Jesus Christ that he, he sacrificed his blood for and he gave his all for, and he cherishes the church. Let's read Ephesians 5. Is it? Have you read? Carry on from 25 to 31, sorry, please. Ephesians 5, 25 to 31. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So in the same way Jesus cleanses the church and purges our wrongs and tells us the things we are not doing well and nurtures and cherishes us the same way the husband should do to his wife. And the same way the wife should allow herself to be cherished and nurtured and looked after by the husband. There are some women who don't like to be looked after. Have you met women like that? You don't know. There are, there, are, there, are women, there are women who tell you, I can look after myself, thank you very much. You open the door for them. Say, why do you open the door for me? I can look after myself. I open the door for myself. So no, 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 no problem. I was just being courteous and kind to you. So is it, is it because I'm a woman? No, 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 it's because you're a human being. And then you open it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I open the door for men, for women. I just out of courtesy. But some, some, some have built that perhaps a defense mechanism that I can look after myself. I do not need anyone. That's why they are suffering. And some may be suffering. And the same thing. The, the church, in this church, well, not Kingsway, but in the church, there are people who do not pray because they don't think they need God's help. They think they've got it all sorted. 
when you say tell them when you tell them to pray they say has it come to that <laughs> yeah they they, 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 they don't they, they don't want to bother god they say it's it's some people whose issues are more serious so if you look at that marriage is a picture of the union between christ and the church and if we are going to have successful marriages we should model it on the union between Christ and the church. Not the kind of relationship your father had with your mother. Not the kind of relationship your prime minister has with his wife. Or <laughs> no human marriage is the ideal model. The only standard is Christ and the church. And if we know how difficult we have been as a church to Christ and he still loves us, then there is no reason for a man to treat his wife badly. No reason. If you really fear God and you really follow the teachings of Christ, there is no reason for you to treat your wife badly. But rather you should be willing to sacrifice your life for the good of your wife. Does that make scriptural sense? Sound teaching. Sound teaching. Amen. Amen. Verse 27, we'll get to 31 and then we... That he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the husband should be doing that to his wife. Present her to your standard. Present her to yourself. Let your eyes be fixed on her, not on anybody else. Your wife is your own. You, 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 sh- let, let, let her have your full attention and your full gaze. Carry on, please. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Mm. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Mm. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. Again, we see flesh and bones from Genesis. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That last verse. Yeah, thank you. So marriage is a picture of Christ's union with the church. Could you read the summary for us, please? The standard of God for marriage is the relationship between Christ and the church. Therefore, you will discover in that scripture that God kept referring to the relationship between Christ and the church to illustrate how a man and his wife should relate. God seems to be saying that if, as a man, you do not understand how to behave and act towards your wife, simply study the life of Christ Jesus and what he did and is still doing for the church, his bride, today, and go do likewise. And if you you are a woman and you seem not to know what God expects of you in your home, Study the relationship between the church and Christ. It will give you a clear picture of how to live. Christ is our perfect example in every way, and God does not compromise that standard. If you discover that you are not measuring up yet to God's standard in marriage, there is no need to waste time lamenting. Mm. Pray and study God's word over this. The Lord will give you light and change you. Amen. The Lord will give you light and change who? Them. (laughs) Every change we seek must begin with us. If I want my wife to be a better wife, I must be a better husband. Look at the man in the mirror. Is it Michael Jackson? How does it go? There is a change. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. Every change we want to see in society begins with me. 
every change I want to see in my marriage starts with me. Every change I want to see in my children starts with me. Every change I want to see in Kingsway starts with me. I was talking to us on Sunday about CIA, control, influence, and accept. I can only work on the things I can control. That's me. I will try to influence others, but I can't control them. Do you know that you can't control your wife? Have you noticed? And I hope you don't want to. Because it would be a miserable thing to be married to a robot. And you can't even control your children. Do you know that? You think, well, even, even the child... In, even the child in the womb, you cannot control. Have you noticed? When you want to sleep, what do they want to do? They are kicking. <laughs> they, they are punching and they are determining. You want to lie on your tummy, but they, they won't let you lie on your tummy. You must lie on your side. They are already controlling and influencing you right from the womb. Even what you want to eat. You can't control any human being. So one of the first things you need to settle is that you can't control anybody. You've learned that the hard way. Yeah, you can't control anybody. Only God. Ask God to change you and ask God to change them. But it's not your job to try to change anybody. Some will say, well, I, I, I will marry her as she is, but when I marry her, I will mold her. <laughs> yeah, now a sculptor. I, I will mold her to become the, the kind of wife I want. Really? You say, well, the man doesn't know how to dress, but when, when we get married, I will teach him how to dress. Really? <laughs> just, <laughs> just realize you can't control anybody you can't change anybody. And just take a deep breath and let it all go. <laughs> just let it go. You can't control anybody. Even God doesn't impose his will on us. So how dare you impose or try to impose your will on somebody else? Leave God to order all your ways. Leave God to order all your ways. Amen. Rely on God. I have learned to trust in Jesus. <laughs> and I'll say that to men and those who will be married men. Don't try to win arguments. Because they have, the females are built to have more words than the males of our species. They can talk. They can talk for England, they can talk for whatever country. <laughs> they, they, if you come to a talking, they would out-talk you. <laughs> Best to walk away. People have been married for 60 years. But, but you, you, don't, you don't aim to win an argument. You have fellowship. Do you notice that Jesus himself doesn't struggle with us? The Bible says, quench not the Holy Spirit. Even the Holy Spirit, if he keeps saying something to you and you refuse to listen, he keeps quiet. That's God. Then you, a fellow human being, you want to impose. Proverbs talks about the nagging wife. Have you read the nagging wife? Better to drip, drip, drip. <laughs> Better to live in the top of the corner of a house a rooftop of a house, than to dwell with a nagging wife. Proverbs. Proverbs, Proverbs, yeah. No man likes people nagging. No male. I haven't seen the male that enjoys being no nagged. One. No one. Nobody. Oh, okay. I thought maybe it was just the men, you know. But if you follow the pattern of Christ, 
He is the standard. The way Christ relates to the church is the standard for our marriage. And we need to say to him, Lord, make me the kind of man who is like Christ. Lord, make me a true bride of Christ. So when you are marrying, you are, you are, you are seeing yourself the way God sees Jesus. If Jesus would serve his wife, then I should serve my wife. Nothing is too low for me to do for her. Jesus could wash the dirty feet of his disciples, so I should be able to stoop and serve my wife. I can give her the car and take the train. I can give her the car and walk. No sacrifice. Jesus gave it all for us when he died on the cross. He offered his entire life for our salvation and security. Hallelujah. There is nothing a husband should not be willing to give up for the good of his wife and his children. That's the standard of scripture. And the same way we come to church and say, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my king. If Jesus is your king and you are married to a man and you go home and you cannot honor your husband, then your Christianity is questionable. You haven't seen Jesus but Jesus has sent a representative to you, which is your husband. Say, your, your husband is me in human form. So the devotion and service that you would have given to me, first give to your husband. I used to say to young brides, you know, because as a pastor, when the pastor is coming to the house, they bring out the best china and all that. That's why I don't announce it when I'm coming to people's houses. They bring out the best china and all that. They cook the best meal and all that. So I say, okay. They will still bring it out anyway. Well, well. But I say, have you done the same thing for your own husband? Because if you haven't honored your husband that way, you shouldn't be doing it to me. Yes, you say, yes, the man of God, but your husband is also the man of God. He's the man of God in your house. If you despise him, you despise God. Same principle. See if we can take one more before we close. Number four. Marriage is ordained by God to be honored and regarded by all. Marriage is ordained by God to be honored and regarded by all. Hebrews 13 and verse 4, please. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. What does that mean? Can I have that in the Amplified Classic, please? Let marriage be held in honor, esteemed worthy, precious, of great price, and especially dear, in all things. And thus let the marriage bed be undefiled, kept undishonored. For God will judge and punish the unchaste, all guilty of sexual vice and adultery. Okay, what do we learn from these, this verse? A husband and wife honor each other. So it's not only the man who should be expecting the wife to honor him. What should the man do? Honor begets honor. Respect begets respect. Do to others what you want others to do to you. 
That's what? What else? I thought you said each of them should buy precious gifts for each other. <laughs> it's part of it. Yeah. What else do we see here? Um, marriage is precious. It should be treasured. It is the right thing to do. We live in society where people feel marriage is old school. I don't need to be married. What's marriage? Marriage is just a piece of paper. I don't need a piece of paper to show that I love someone. I just love them. I tell them that I love them. So I don't need a piece of paper. It's just a piece of paper. Commitment. God does not like adultery. What's adultery? So taking somebody else's spouse. Stick to your own. Say, well, she doesn't actually... <laughs> That's your own. <laughs> Stick with your own. Don't go about taking other people's. Or wishing that the other people's spouses were your were yours. Serious verse. Very serious verse. Notice it says, For God will judge and punish the unchaste. There are some other punishments that God sends other people to do. But this one he he supervises the punishment by himself. He executes it by himself. God takes it so seriously that he made a commandment. One of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Uh, um, sir? Yes. Just, back it, just backing up a, a tiny bit. Um, you know, in, in, um, in the time of Abraham and so on, um, did they actually have marriages or they just um, call the person their wife or their husband? So they go in their house and stay there. No, they had marriages because Abraham called his servant Eliezer, Genesis 24, and said, go to my people and get a wife for my son Isaac from them. And they brought the woman to him and they were joined together and they became. Some people argue that, well, if you don't marry in church, then it's not marriage. No. There are symbols of commitment that are made and recognized. Um, it's not just when you stand here if you got married in the court, <laughs> you've made a vow. If you got married in, I mean, I got married three times, or we got married. Oh, no, we were going, we went to get married three, three ceremonies, but we did two because the two of them were combined into one. Um, Please clarify that it's the same woman you were married. It's the same woman, wife. the same woman, the same woman, <laughs> same woman. Well, we have in, 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 in Nigeria, you, you have the traditional wedding. Then there's the court wedding. And then there's the church wedding. Yeah. So all three. But those churches that are recognized by the government can give you a certificate that combines both. So we did that. And it was both a church and legal uh, court wedding. But if you've just done the traditional, so when we got married, I'll tell you something. I don't know if Chainsie is listening. Um, she, she is, okay. Um, when, we, when we got married, we got married, uh, we did the traditional one first, six days before the church wedding. So Granddad James said to me, um, she's now your wife. <laughs> But we are Christians. So wait till 
you do the church wedding? Say, yes, daddy, of course. But from the point where we did that traditional wedding, she was my wife. Full-fledged, complete, it was okay. So wasn't this, that type of ceremony, Abraham and those people? Whatever ceremony they used at that time was recognized. Even when, when, Jesus, when Exodus 20, they knew how they were getting married. So they knew who was someone else's wife. So then, so then, um, so then, if a man decides to take a woman, let's say the Rastafarians in my country, I can use them as an example. They do not do church weddings. They take the person and say, this is my wife. And they will live for that, with that person for the, for a, a long time several of them their marriage last and they just have one wife so are we saying that the um that type of um, marriage is not they're married yeah they are married it's a mm -hmm. recognized marriage yeah so, so how is that then different from the person who is living with a man the same man for you know god know how long they have married <laughs> Pardon? they have they married they have married yeah okay. therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined, joined right? i don't want to go into the technicality of it yeah. but the joining is a joining That's so when the marriage starts. Those persons are living in sin. How do you say they're living in sin? Hmm. We'll come to that. <laughs> Sorry, my brain is... <laughs> yeah. But marriage is honorable in all, means that all of us should honor marriage. We should esteem it as something worth looking forward to, worth, something worth celebrating, something worth preserving yourself for, something worth cherishing. It was a great joy for me that Elder Morris and Grandma Joy and Grandma Carol could come all the way to honor Dittier, all the way to Cambridge for his wedding. I thought that was a huge... I, and I stepped into the church and I saw him. I said, whoa, this is a great honor. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. So when we see people being genuinely married, we should celebrate. We should honor them. We should cherish it. We should see it as something worth doing. Not join those who say, there's no point in getting married. And we should not dishonor their marriages. Do not be the cause for a husband and a wife to separate. Do not be the cause for there to be friction between a husband and a wife. Do not go and spread gossip that will separate them. Do not sponsor divorce. That's another way. Marriage is honorable among all. Treat married people with respect. Even if they are younger than you, once this is a married woman, you give them where we come from, they call them, we don't call them sisters, they call, we call them madam. It, it's, it's a way of showing respect that they have come into the institution of marriage ordained by God. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge by himself. Very solemn. May God have mercy on us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Could you read the summary for us, please, uh, for number four? I think we'll stop there. Marriage is honorable in all. God commended it to be so. And he does not deal kindly with anyone that tries to dishonor it, whether as an outsider or even as a partner in that marriage. As a married person, God expects you to honor your marriage, and you must also not in any way dishonor another person's marriage. 
as soon as you are married, God honours that relationship. Mm. It makes no difference whether you are believers or unbelievers when you got married. It matters not whether you had a traditional wedding or a church wedding. You are to regard that marriage in honour. Whoremongers and adulterers, God shall judge. The fact that you got married as an unbeliever is not a biblical basis to separate from your partner and remarry another now that you are born again. If you are having problems in the marriage, take it to the Lord, the maker of marriage. He will make things right and turn your situation around. Amen. Amen. I think we'll stop there for tonight. Any questions or comments, please? God is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we can ask or think. Do we think this is a hard saying? What we've talked about tonight. It's the Bible. It's the word of God. Sorry. <laughs> it is the word of God. We will not always agree with the word of God, with everything that the Bible says, because it is outside of what we believe. It is outside of what we were taught. So what we have to do is then ask God for grace, you know, to take what is being taught. Yeah. When you bring yourself to the word of God, you say, Lord, take me as I am. Break me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. In any way I've gone contrary to your will, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Bring me back to your perfect purpose. And if you're on the track, Lord, keep me from sin. Keep me on your track. Help me to do things your way. In the name of Jesus. Shall we pray? Here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in Father, we come to you just as we are. We have heard your word. No man can keep your word by himself unless you help him or her. So, Father, we ask you tonight, please help us. Amen. Where we have made mistakes, Lord, we are sorry. Please forgive us. Please bring us back to your perfect purpose. Keep us in the way of the Lord. Pour your love into our hearts the same way Jesus loved the world so much that he sacrificed his life for her. Let the same power that raised Jesus from the dead quicken our mortal bodies. Let the same love of God flood our hearts that we may love you in increasing measures and love one another and love our spouses the way Jesus loves the church. Lord, we pray for all marriages here and across the world and especially in the church of Jesus Christ. I pray that you help us to model our marriages after Christ. 
that we will follow the standards of your scripture. No matter what society is doing, oh God, keep us following you. And use us, Lord, to showcase your original intention of union between one man and his wife. We give you thanks and we give you praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank God, sir. Amen. We thank God, sir. Thank you for joining us. We meet again tomorrow for prayer meeting. Is there a coffee morning tomorrow? There no coffee morning. So we meet at 7.30 for prayer meeting. Um, those of you here and those at home, you can listen to it again or watch again. YouTube, Facebook, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. <laughs> God bless you. Have a good evening.